so here you see how IKEA has grown and the reason for that. And it's important to know to remark that we have set a franchising system, which is important because uh, we operate in this way across the world. And here we have a, a concept owner where I work currently. It's called Interikea. We create a concept, we, we improve it, we develop it continuously, and it is then run by different franchisees, the IKEA retailers around the world. So they get the framework, they get the concept, and they, with their entrepreneurial spirit, they make it alive in each market, creating inspiring furniture, showrooms, uh, relationship with the customers, and all the, using all the solutions that I provided from the range which is developed by IKEA Sweden. <clears throat> the product developers in IKEA Sweden use a model called democratic design in which they balance a number of factors that you see here, form, function, quality, sustainability, and low price. So their ambition is not only to make things, but to make things better. And then we have a supply chain. As you can see, we are a broad uh, network of companies. And there's a company or a number of companies called, uh, that run the supply chain, taking all this great range, uh, making it uh, manufactured by another company called the IKEA Industry uh, Group and several other manufacturers, producing flat packs and distributing them across the world in different ways. Once they reach the store, the customers take it and of course they enjoy experience in the store uh, including their good food and the services and the companies and the organizations that provide uh, those services. I'm going to stop the video now there is a lot more that we could say but I think for the purpose of this presentation um, which is about digital transformation it gives you a flavor of the journey of IKEA so far. If I translate this into numbers uh, what we see is uh, a tremendous, actually, sales development. Uh, here I have figures until 2015, and, and it, we kept growing also in 2016. Um, so all this is, um, is that is uh, actually happening, has been happening mainly according to the model you have seen so far, which you can say is, uh, is very much built on brick and mortar and on a uh, traditional and successful way. Um, if I put even more numbers, and again this, the bold numbers are from 2015, we can see that uh, yeah, we have lots of stores, now there are almost 400 stores, we have lots of visits in the store, we have a lot of square meters and a lot of co-workers, now we have reached more than 180,000 co-workers globally. What is perhaps Interesting here to note is that to notice is that uh, th there is also there has been a tremendous growth in IKEA website visits, uh, we, we, which is now actually be beyond two billion per year. So you can say we are running uh, besides our physical presence, we are also running a major uh, online presence. And just when I joined this company uh, eight years ago, or this organization, uh, actually there were less website visits than in-store visits. And you see that now we are you know, more than twice uh, the number in, in online. So what happened? Uh, we have, of course, uh, this is no new news to you, but it, of course, uh, connects to a number of other transformations and micro trends you're all familiar with. And again, think, picture this in a couple of years ago where we were looking at all these trends, multiple speed economy, we have uh, middle income population growing, globalization, urbanization, uh, we have also behavioral changes in the society, one of which is digital technology uh, becoming a revolution, basically. Uh, resources, resource scarcity, concern with health and safety, and lots of other trends. So I'm not, I don't repeat because I, I think you are familiar with them. But we started looking at these things together, and we identified five different transformational areas across uh, IKEA and beyond. And again, I'm going to flip through them quickly. One is about customer experience. Um, another one is about uh, growth potential, market uh, growth potential. We have a lot of 
uh, room for growth, actually. In IKEA, in, in some continents, we're not even present, for example. Uh, the next one I want to highlight is digital technology, but I will spend a little bit more time on that, of course. Uh, creating an emotional bond, connecting with different people, and caring for the people in their environment. And one of these transformational areas is, of course, uh, where I focus on, <clears throat> and we believe that that is really, really uh, has a massive impact and a, and a tremendous opportunities, opportunity for, uh, for IKEA. So I'm going to zoom into that, and at that time, a couple of years ago, we said, okay, we're going to have, we have to get started on this. I'm trying to yeah, share with you the story of what happens what happened in the different uh, steps. And so we first drafted um, some kind of a, a business direction, which in which we would capture all these uh, phenomenal trends and changes that were happening in the society, and try to outline how to go about it. Uh, what were these these trends? I only can give you a few examples in the, in this very limited time. So one is the speed, the speed and the life cycle of things. So in, you might have seen this chart before, uh, it, you know, the time it took for the telephone to reach 50 million users was about 75 years, and it would go all the way down to Instagram six months, and I uh, stopped there because, of course, uh, if I take Pokemon Go or <laughs> things like that, more recent things, we're probably even talking about days or, uh, or, or less. Um, so, how can we benefit of that? How can we actually also uh, yeah, uh, pursue the opportunities behind it at the same time keeping the core strength uh, without uh, you know, having to lose and throw away all the good things we have developed uh, so far? Another reflection, an important uh, realization, awareness here is that uh, we are not, nobody is actually exempt from this transformation. So every single uh, in industry is affected and disrupted as a reality. So you know this, the biggest uh, hotel chain doesn't have uh, hotels, the biggest uh, you know, car or taxi company doesn't have taxis, etc., etc. The biggest retailer doesn't have stores. So uh, at least so far. So we are all in this uh, tremendous disruption and uh, also possible opportunity. And in fact, talking about opportunities, we can. This is an old estimate of the number of de billion devices connected uh, in the Internet of Things now and in 2020. And I think it's largely understated. So it says here from 1 billion to 26 billion devices. Um, so. What can we do about it? I mean, we uh, claim, uh, IKEA claims to be uh, ho home furnishing, in the home furnishing business, a big home furnishing retailer. So how can we take advantage of this? All this data generated by these devices in every home. So it's a huge opportunity for innovation, and uh, it's not only a, a threat of a disruption. <clears throat> um, Another reflection is, uh, you, as you hopefully have appreciated in the short video, uh, is that we operate across a, a completely you know, horizontally integrated value chain. So how can we uh, see and take advantage of this digitalization impact in all this, the steps of this value chain, all the elements of this value chain? Um, <clears throat> so. One more uh, reflection, I, again, I will not be comprehensive, but one more thing we noticed is that it is not going to be enough to just continue our uh, traditional way of developing and, and um, yeah, creating new products. We need to be more curious and experimenting in a way. Um, we also realized that we, could, we cannot do this alone. We are part of an ecosystem in which we want to involve as many parties as possible and engage with them instead of trying to control every single step of our value chain. Um, and then one more uh, item that we, one more thing that we never actually want to lose is our vision. So we actually reflected a lot about is this still valid? for IKEA to, to focus on creating a better everyday life for the many people, which is our vision for many, many years. Well, when I, when I reflect on that, uh, we actually see that we, uh, we don't really need to change this much, because people in the everyday life already now, the many people already live in the digital world as much as in the physical world. So 
can we can we use that to actually make a better everyday life contribute to that at least from an IKEA point of view? Um, as a, yeah, in, in the attempt, let's say, to to make sense of this or to create a direction that we could, um, you know, we could all believe in, we actually decided to create um, an event, a workshop, uh, in which we would take a long-term view. We would engage a number of different parties, uh, almost like a cross-section of the entire IKEA ecosystems and beyond and um, get input on this direction, get as much as possible aligned without losing the IKEA culture, so still anchoring this in the IKEA culture, and find some kind of priorities we could go after. So this was a quick run through uh, of the, the history before we actually started uh, this. We, we agreed to do this workshop and we did it last October. And we call it Future Search, which is a methodology we have used previously in other topics, other big transformational topics like sustainability, quality, uh, India, China, and things like that. So <clears throat> we call it I digital the IKEA way. And the reason for that is that we could just go digital full stop, right? right? Just to, for the sake of it or just to be, uh, to do what everybody else is doing. But um, that is, that wasn't uh, actually enough for us or is not it's not really where we, what we want because just to copy paste uh, what others are doing is not what we used to and is not does, it doesn't satisfy us so that's why we added this the IKEA way how can we describe IKEA once we are we have gone through this digital revolution this digitalization process so what happened in this workshop uh, is that we took customers dreams into account we had uh, a, a digital transformation ambition in mind. We took, um, included the whole value chain, products, how do we shop, how do we retail, how do we provide services. Uh, we included many, many different people and um, <clears throat> we took an even better view. So not just saying, okay, we want to be better than the past or we want to actually continue to be good, but what can do we do in order to be even better? Uh, and get confidence to shape our strategies with a common view together. Um, we gathered in about 70, 72 people, um, all watch actually completely analog in analog, analog way. So there were no presentations, no uh, speak, speeches and so on, but more or rather everything happening in the room. So you can see here uh, yeah, a picture of, of the room. Um, in, in which we looked both at the past, the present, and the future, and we drew on the wall the biggest mind map I've ever seen, at least in, uh, in, uh, yeah, on paper, and landed on nine what we call common ground statements, which form a vision uh, of what we would like to pursue. And let me make a disclaimer here. I'm not claiming that this will work for you or for anybody else. So I'm just sharing, and I don't claim even to be this to be any lecture. I'm just just sharing what works for us, what we believe works for us. So just don't maybe don't take it too seriously, but you know you have to embed it in your reality if this would make any sense for you. So I spoke about this mind map here. Here's a picture of it. Uh, you can't. It's really even difficult to read. But in, what we considered in, as input to this roadmap uh, captured in it is our trends that we were relevant to our uh, transformation. And then we voted on them, we put this, the, all these dots and circled the, in these bubbles what are the most uh, important ones. And in order to make it a bit easier for you to read, I summarized those seven or six actually uh, trends in this chart. So it is about everything going mobile, real-time data, co-creation and partnership, social media, knowledge available to all and free uh, by and large, and, and then a collaborative and sharing economy. So we thought together that there may be many other trends that are important for you or for others or even for us, but together we came to this conclusion. Um, then we have had an interesting part. I was wondering if I should share this or not, but uh, I think it is important. So there were two interesting sessions. One asking ourselves, what are we sorry for? And another one asking just after, what are we proud of? 
we thought it was very. I thought I think it, it was really one of the most insightful one because it, here you see, uh, yeah, something where yeah we 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 do see the need for a change, but also something that we don't want to lose, like the IKEA brand value, etc. The interesting thing, well, maybe you can read it for yourself, so that's not, I think it's hopefully self-explanatory. One of the things, maybe the last one is a bit more tricky, the, the last of the story. So um, we, we, were, we, had, um, people, we had people here also from outside IKEA. Out of the 72 people, maybe 20 or 21 were from outside. So what, I, what do I mean? They were researchers, professors, they were uh, suppliers, customers, and, and um, yeah, even technology developers, technology companies. So one, there was one group of customers, and when we asked them, what are you sorry for? They said, well, we could, they couldn't find anything better than uh, saying well, that they had taken too many pencils from the IKEA stores. So that was a little bit of fun part, and uh, we said that we are happy for them to come and take as many pencils as they, as they want, as long as they come and visit us in the store. But it was, apart from the joke, little joke, it was really good to have customers provoking us, because otherwise we, we keep talking about or, or living in our bubble. Um, then we have, there were lots of debates, uh, reflections, <coughs> and um, yeah, and then, yeah, re out of these reflections we came up with this common ground statements, and I'm going to really quickly run through them before uh, we can maybe entertain some questions. So the first one was ecosystem. Uh, we want to, we want IKEA, all these are expressed, by the way, in a present tense, as you know, imagining we would be there uh, 15 years from now, something like that. So IKEA, in 15 years, imagine, is at the center of an ecosystem, enabling the many people to live the life they aspire to. This, for us, was a big movement, because we, we, we don't feel that we are there now, and that's uh, and that's a change we we wish to uh, to pursue. Um, <clears throat> the second one was more of the many. How can we reach really more of the many people that we um, aim for? Because we are still, believe it or not, we are still rather small when when it comes to uh, people who can access uh, IKEA products, and um, and that is. That has to do with you know some even limitations of our business model. So how can we use digitalization to help overcoming these uh, limitations? <clears throat> the third one was knowledge, and um, can we make IKEA the place to go for life at home knowledge? So when when people have a need and wish uh, to improve their life at home, do they think of IKEA now? Can they do that? Can they connect with the community? Can we create that community? <clears throat> yeah, this lady you see in the picture, um, I don't know if anybody knows her. She is, uh, her name is Jul Yap. She is a Malaysian lady and, and blogger. And she has uh, founded a, a blog, a super active blog called IKEA Hackers, uh, spontaneously formed, in which what, basically what they do is they buy IKEA products and uh, yeah, use them in a different way than they were designed, and then share their uh, pictures, their models, their uh, solutions uh, with each other, w with the, the whole ecosystem uh, that participates to this uh, blog, um, in a way that is uh, yeah, inspiring for them, with very, very accurate instructions and extremely clever uh, ideas. So at some point, IKEA was a little bit nervous, about this, um, <clears throat> and uh, started to, yeah, to consider whether they sh we should actually stop them. But in reality, they, we we fortunately didn't do that, and we engaged with them, and they are actually we discovered they are among the best um, customers we have, the best fans of IKEA. So we rather collaborate with them and start building this n common knowledge. The next one is about data, and that is super important. Uh, I think, do we see, can we use data as an asset, as a core asset to build value from, and enable us to actually become leader, be better leaders of life at home? Uh, so, for example, I mean, we, there are companies that only use data as assets. They don't have other assets at all. And we, we have a lot of data. We sit on, like, IKEA family as a, our, our loyalty program. 
which has now uh, more than 100 million members. So that's a big family. And they are all willing, and maybe you are members of this as well, and you are willing to share your data with us. But what are we doing with that? Are we able to create value with that? Uh, very humbly, I can say that we are just scratching the surface of that, uh, the value of that gold mine we're sitting on. Um, <clears throat> that's just one example of, of the many we could use. Uh, the next one is about exploring innovation. Um, and then, um, yeah, here it is more about how we work. So uh, we, it is not about only uh, what we do, but it's, it's how. How do we innovate? How do we explore new products, new ideas? Uh, and, and, you know, how do we do this in a collaborative way with, with an ecosystem um, <clears throat> beyond, you know, beyond us? Uh, or, yeah, of people that are interested and willing and able uh, to cooperate with us, whether it is um, yeah, uh, creating new products or um, creating new services or providing services or collaborating in any way. Um, the next uh, big movement we would like to pursue is to is customer centric. Uh, and this is about really um, yeah, listening to the customers and really uh, interacting with them at any time, any place, in any way, in their language, creating good relationships. Uh, we, have, we have that in, we have some, of course, examples of that here and there. We have, of course, actually a lot of good success there when people are happy to come to the store and have instant gratification, etc. But in a digitalizing, increasingly digitalizing world, are we really customer-centric? Are we really there what the customers are? And um, yeah, and this is about, of course, uh, being mobile, being in, you know, in the different uh, different new interfaces that are coming up every week, uh, etc. And really creating a bonding and a good relationship with them. The next one is about embedding and embracing technology. So this is more maybe an internal movement. Uh, but how do we start with digital in mind in whatever we develop? When we develop, for example, new products, a new kitchen or something like that, uh, we, we, seldom, we, we seldom think of digital in a uh, early stage. We, we normally develop the kitchen first, and then we see what else we can add to it in the way we sell it, in the way we, I don't know, market it, or, uh, uh, you know, with add-ons, with uh, not only devices or fringes, uh, things, things on the fringes, on the edge of the kitchen. But if we would start immediately with digital in mind, we will probably develop even the different kitchens. Just as to illustrate with an example what we meant, uh, the, the, the extent to which we, we want to cover, let's say, this, uh, this topic. Um, the next one is integrated value chain. It sounds like, yeah, more, uh, not traditional, I would say, but still, uh, yeah, still what we have been trying to do for many, many, many years. Uh, but there, we still, we see that there are still a lot of opportunities there also enabled by new digitalization. Uh, internet of things in factories, Internet of things in, in during the supply chain, having you know seamless processes, uh, robotization. There are many many examples of things that can uh, improve, make make this value chain stronger and uh, even yeah more more uh, yeah faster, more reliable, etc. And the last one, number nine, was empower co-workers. So here, yeah, in uh, maybe. If there are people from retail, uh, we are also probably all in a similar place where we haven't historically looked at our workers as uh, yeah, people that can actually make a big difference and uh, have been increasingly left behind, at least in our reality, uh, compared with the level of information that customers have now and the, the level of uh, data that is required for, for co-workers to actually run a, prof a professional and more e effective business. So we want to take a big step in empowering them, and that means also uh, a lot of digitally enabled uh, solutions. Um, <clears throat> OK, so th with those nine, I would say, yeah, lighthouses or, or uh, yeah, common views, uh, we want, of course, to, to take the, more the lead than we have done what we have done before. So we don't want just to follow other, other companies and other retailers. We want to do things differently, but with a meaning. 
not just for the sake of it. Then uh, we asked uh, a number of people, you see other participants here, and there, were, there was really a lot of energy, if I go back to this workshop, there was a lot of energy and a lot of ambition, as well as a lot of challenges identified. So I don't have time to read all of them, but um, yeah, they were all uh, energized. And here's another uh, group of, of another yeah, uh, a group of feedback statements uh, from the different participants. Uh, and they're all about, well, yes, there are challenges, but now we see opportunities and uh, now we, uh, see, we see a lot of commitment going forward. In the end, we even sat around the big room and uh, or in a big circle, I would say, and then we ask everybody to share one word, and not all of them behaved, some of them uh, had more than one word, but they were all super positive and committed. And um, <coughs> I'm going to almost close now with a, a bit of a metaphor, I don't know if you have heard this before, the blind man and the elephant. So if you haven't, the, the way the story goes is you have five or seven blind men uh, around an elephant, and everybody is uh, able to, to touch one part of, of the elephant. So the one sitting next to, or to the leg says, this is a tree. Uh, the one near, near the trunk says, uh, this is a snake. And uh, the one near the ears says, this is a fan. Uh, so the idea is that they were all wrong because they were looking at one part of the whole, of the entire system. But when, we, when they share what they perceive together, uh, only at that point can they describe that, that it is an elephant. And then, <clears throat> so everybody is right in uh, his or her perspective, but together they are better in identifying what really this thing is. Um, we also realize that there is, uh, this is one of our old mantras, that most things are meant to be done, it comes from our founder, and we, so we realize that there is a long way to go. But uh, we want to start, we feel strong that now we have a, a stronger alignment. And you know what, this already happened a few <coughs> months ago, and uh, things are actually already in motion. So it's even by just getting together and aligning on some uh, visionary statements, we, are, we saw a, a movement in action. And, um, and this is fantastic to see. People are, take, are more encouraged to take initiative, and they are, um, yeah, taking taking steps to make them real. So with, with all this, of course, uh, it's only the beginning of the journey, as we see. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we are um, yeah comfortable that uh, at least for IKEA, this way will work better than having uh, maybe a top-down, top-steered transformational process, which will uh, yeah. Uh, in the end, be too slow uh, if we wanted to go for that. Uh, for actually the challenge we have ahead. That was my last slide. Thank you, Paolo. But let me start with uh, one question: Did you or IKEA determine any KPI, key performance indicators, uh, in order to see whether you're still on track with um, digital transformation and, and the end goal that you um, have in mind? Mm -hmm. Uh, and the short answer is no, no not yet. Um, and the, then, then if you ask me, should we have some KPIs? I think we should have some high-level KPIs uh, to to respect the the, the, K, the key <laughs> part, um, because otherwise we, we revert back to a traditional way of measuring specific goals. And um, and ma making it uh, actually a self-fulfilling prophecy because we, we, when you set a, a, a two specific goal, you will never achieve more than that. Uh, we want to have um, uh, people actually give people room to exceed, uh, yeah, specific uh, or um, tangible goals and more uh, go more into real transformation. At least this is what we believe uh, works in IKEA. Uh, we've got a couple of questions here. Uh, let me go through them. So a question from Hendrik. Uh, what are the most important IT projects today to do your digital transformation? So how do you translate that into uh, tangible technology uh, decisions or projects? Yeah. So 
Uh, good, uh, good question. Good, absolutely good question. So, uh, first, there are a number of things that are already going on, uh, let's say, even before we, we had this workshop. Uh, so, for example, multi channel is, is one of the biggest investments we have ever done, and we are right in the middle of that program, uh, opening up uh, more and more channels and connecting them together, uh, ma making them available to customers and contact centers and people in the co, co workers in the stores. So we have seen our e-commerce business uh, growing in more and more countries and um, in volume uh, dramatically. In fact, more more than our, bigger than our KPIs. I remember a few years ago we set a goal that by 2015 we would have uh, five percent of our business on uh, on e-commerce, and by 2020 we would have ten percent. And now we are uh, already we have already exceeded the 2020 goal. Uh, now I'm not, yeah, su you know, super proud of that because uh, maybe maybe the goal was a little bit uh, from a denial point of view or was uh, uh, yeah conservative. Uh, but uh, I'm happy that they are that you know they are succeeding with this uh, program and they are finding ways uh, of both changing our uh, let's say platforms and at the same time. Um, grabbing the opportunities here and now. Uh, so the, that's always important not to just focus completely on, on the new without, uh, yeah, without keeping enough attention to the current uh, business. Then having said that, multi-channel is, is a program with many, other, many, many different projects and changes, uh, but it's not the only thing that we are doing. So we have uh, things in the, for example, in, the pro in our own core products range, uh, that are uh, that have started the journey towards the home smart, uh, yeah, uh, direction. So we have product, products in the market and in the pipeline uh, that are um, uh, enabling, for example, light bulbs to be connected to the internet, uh, and uh, and they you know they can be controlled by uh, yeah any any devices basically uh, through gateways that allow us to understand uh, the, the way these products are used and it's now light bulbs but it can, it can be anything so uh, there's a lot going on we are playing experimenting with digital reality with uh, conversational interfaces we're experimenting with 3d printing yeah a little bit everywhere uh, so I could I would say uh, now if I use a, a two by two uh, between energy and structure, we have now generated a lot of energy, um, and and we have a limited structure. So you could maybe call it a, a definition of chaos, uh, perhaps. Yeah, and there is okay. It is okay to be a little chaotic in these circumstances, but we with minimal structure, we can also uh, maximize the the up output, the, uh, the the outcome of this of this energy. Still, maybe last uh, comment respecting the fact. But in, when you are in an in innovation process, you need to have failure. You need to allow people to fail and learn. And uh, so all we're, what we're asking people to do is to fail, but share what failures are there and why they are failing. OK, thank you. We've got a couple of questions um, coming in. I think that uh, second and third question are more or less the same. So the question is, who has put uh, the whole project in motion? And what are the responsibilities? So what was your responsibility and, and who was basically leading that uh, even outside of uh, the CIO? Yeah. So, um, if, first of all, it's not a project. So we, we, we're not managing that project. We don't have uh, as a project. We don't have a steering group and uh, mechanisms like that. Um, it's, uh, we can call it a movement. And the sponsorship comes from the top. So the CEO is uh, himself sponsoring it, but uh, together with uh, a group of stakeholders who have aligned responsibility and uh, in, in their own uh, strategies they are, re they are reflecting all these uh, common ground statements or, or common visions. Then if I talk of my responsibility, uh, but more as a maybe CDO rather than CIO, uh, uh, that's uh, that my responsibility is actually to uh, keep this energy together and uh, facilitate the sharing of that uh, of what's going on and uh, to facilitate 
make it possible, let's say, for people to, have, to actually enjoy a common vision and keep uh, hold it together. That's that is the that is my role actually here. So, yeah, I I, I don't have a, I don't want to create um, a, a bottleneck of uh, you know a digital lab where everything is developed and so everybody that needs something digital has to come to me and ask me and my team uh, to develop the solution. Uh, on the contrary, we actually would like uh, every IKEA organization, it could, this could be pecu peculiar in the way IKEA is structured with a, as a franchise system rather than, uh, uh, say, a, a single group of companies. Um, yeah, so they, they, they would, uh, we encourage them to develop, to uh, innovate, and, uh, and to share what they do, what they find, their learnings. It's a different way. I'm, I'm not, uh, I mean, I come from uh, other companies where this was not the way of working. So I'm not saying that uh, this can work anywhere, again, but um, it's, um, it fits IKEA and perhaps there is something in there to be learned because uh, it's, um, it's more, clo it's closer to how um, other companies that, more, um, that, that were born uh, more as recent startups actually operate. Because if I think of Airbnb or uh, yeah, the Facebook and things like that, uh, they actually do already operate as ecosystems. They don't develop everything. They actually create platforms and then the, the developments are done by the ecosystem. So can we emulate, can we uh, learn also from that and try to, even though we are a big organization, can we work as if we were uh, a little bit smaller? Okay. Question from uh, Kun van Loo. Um How do you look at the return of investment of the, the projects? Uh, do you have anything set up front mm -hmm. in terms of how? Yeah, each each project we haven't actually changed uh, the the return of investment approach we have had uh, or the business case approach we've had uh, for uh, projects uh, before, and this is this applies to the big. Uh, projects uh, like multi-channel, the big where there are big investments and there are specific goals, etc. Um, what we ha have added, though, is a different view at the innovation process projects. And I think I'm sure you're all familiar with the du dual governance and um, yeah, uh, and, you know, dual speed or by model. There are many, there are similar definitions uh, of that. So. In this uh, second mode, uh, if I put it this way, uh, we have had to create different criteria, different uh, approaches. And so we give people the possibility to uh, start something innovative without a big red tape, uh, without uh, super uh, complex um, yeah, calculations, but more with uh, 1A4 or 2A4 uh, pages where uh, they, could, they would describe what they want to try. Uh, and. Um, you know, and they have they have a, a faster way of, of getting funds for that for getting budgets. So this this um, is perhaps a, yeah different than in the past. And we, what we are also experiencing there and, and uh, taking care of is that once once they find something useful and scalable, that we have a way to uh, put them into the mainstream, and uh, not necessarily the same team. But uh, hand it, they can hand it over to uh, parts of the companies, you know, the company that um, is able to, yeah, the parts of the eyeball, let's say, to scale it up. Mm -hmm. I think the, the next couple of questions are a little bit similar, uh, and they're about the assessing the impact of uh, digital transformation on the organization, so the IT organization, but as well the overall organization. Um, so, what is your view on that? Yeah. 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 Um, if I start with the IT organization, uh, the, the impact is actually quite sensi sensible or quite significant because uh, what I see is that, uh, yeah, uh, many many people in different roles in uh, IT are actually starting to be curious and interested uh, to or, or, yeah to different ways of working. Uh, faster, cutting, cutting maybe some corners, uh, using more cloud, using mobile. Uh, in fact, some of them are actually going back to the to their roots almost. So, I've, for example, I I know I sponsored, co-sponsored together with some other colleagues, 
uh, uh, work or yeah, uh, what an event and, and it's a series of events where we involved uh, IT architects on a voluntary basis, and <clears throat> they they went through an innovation cycle uh, in which they actually could create prototypes. And some of them told me when I when I was in part of the jury and, and looking at uh, their output, I was very very inspired by their <clears throat> what they have created. Some told me that it's for the first time in like in the last ten years that they developed something, rather than creating powerpoints and and writing papers, writing white papers or, or, or similar. So can you imagine you have this potential of people that actually can develop, can create something real, a prototype or of real products? And uh, and then uh, enjoy, and they enjoy that even in, in doing it in the spare time, um, but we we ask them on a daily basis to write uh, presentations and documents. Yeah, it made me think. You know, is this really how we want? Uh, what, what, what we expect from people, or what, or what they expect, or what they enjoy? Then the impact beyond that is also quite significant. <coughs> What I can see is that there's a much more curiosity. I, I'll give you an example. In this workshop, we talked a lot about uh, digital and IT things. In the past, uh, what happened often in the past is talking about problems, issues, uh, you know, uh, many yeah, failures, projects that didn't work, and so on. All the th all the things that we incidents, etc., that we that typically have been the subject of many many discussions when talking about digital and IT matters. Um, in this workshop, I saw a different energy. I, there, there were a lot, most of the people were actually not from the IT functions, uh, but people from the you know, business leaders. And I have seen them running after these, these topics with uh, a lot of ownership. So for example, at, this, at the end, there were nine flip charts lined up with these nine topics. And, and we asked uh, people to uh, Volunteer to own topics, and when there was it was time to choose someone for data as an asset, uh, there was one guy, you know, business area manager, so really cool from the core business, literally running through the room and grabbing this, hugging this flip chart, and saying, "This is mine." Yeah, and I've never seen that before. I've never seen that energy. Normally, there would have been a much more detached approach, and again, focusing on problems and not on opportunities and, uh, and vision. Okay, Paula, are you still there? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's, uh, yeah. Next question yeah. is uh, coming from Thomas. Uh, who's asking very specifically what the plans are with uh, real-time data analytics um, that can go various directions, but what, what exactly will it be used yeah. for at, at IKEA? Yeah, it, it's actually both. So, uh, it's all, we say all. So, uh, it is product optimization for sure, because like I mentioned, the home smart example I mentioned before can give us a lot of information about how products can be can be better, uh, and um, yeah, whether they are sensors on appliances or uh, sensors in the store, uh, etc. Uh, but also, uh, yeah, data in the house. I mean, for example, take another example. Uh, maybe this is not so real time, but uh, people when they buy a kitchen, they they plan that through our through, through an application we provide, which is called a home planner or kitchen planner. So. Yeah, that, so basically we have data from customers that have bought kitchens and they have mapped and we know exactly what they bought, uh, where, uh, how, how the, the room design is and um, you know if we, we could follow up on that we would have data that would allow us to really have better products not only uh, better information about uh, customers. Then, uh, in terms of business creation, creation and client understanding, uh, there is a lot of value there as well. There is a lot of opportunity. Uh, social media listening is an example where we can really be better understand what people are feeling and, and talking about uh, based on their conversations, let's say, on social media. So this is also a technique that is becoming more and more uh, popular, and, and we are scratching the surface of that. And in terms of business creation, 
we have, for example, um, started already a project in which we create, uh, it's called Co-Create IKEA. And it's a network in which people can subscribe and they can be anybody and um, participate to challenges. So we put challenges, like for the moment we are experimenting with the bathroom products. So we put a challenge and then people can respond with uh, creating, sharing designs, creating, sharing solutions, sharing ideas, participating to the creation of the very products that we will in the end develop uh, through our fantastic uh, developers. So these are some examples. Yeah, which uh, brings us to the last question, I think, uh, coming from Joachim. Are there any moonshot type of projects at IKEA? Uh, so projects that might disrupt your own business model uh, and the sector at large? Yeah, I love this question. <laughs> because, uh, and, uh, and yes, the answer is, is yes. And of course, it's a little bit difficult to, to talk about them because uh, by definition, they are disruptive. <laughs> so yeah, I, you know, I have to be careful here. But uh, what I can say, uh, what I can share is that, uh, as, an, as an example, we have traditionally entered markets uh, with our proven approach. So going there, opening, opening a store, and then uh, having, yeah, uh, and then having yeah, lots of visitors in the store, etc. That takes, that is great. It worked so far, and it still works. But it also creates a major uh, yeah, effort before you can enter a market. And it may, may sound, sound yeah, uh, no, a no-brainer uh, to some, but uh, for us, it, it can be a major thing if we were to enter a market in a different way. And I, I have stopped to, stop, to stop there without saying too much, but I, I guess you're all uh, clever and, and you understand that yeah, uh, you know that means uh, using yeah different ways, different logistics, different uh, even sourcing products. And, uh, to some extent, we actually are already sourcing now through social network, which is a fantastic way of, of creating products with small means, uh, with a positive impact on the on the population. Yeah, I was talking about social entrepreneurs, which in some uh, um, yeah, pilots already in some areas already provide us with top quality products, the compliant with our quality standards, uh, really made by people, by people, by women, especially in in countries, in places that they you know well they wouldn't be able to have any chance for for having a for creating a business. And now they can make products, and they have a steady revenue uh, from IKEA, and they and they have you know some of the best products we've ever done. So this is also very encouraging as a different way of creating business. Okay, brilliant. Well, um, Paolo, uh, this brings us to the end of this uh, webinar. Um, many many thanks for your time and for your open answers to uh, to many questions.